Good evening. Welcome to Vibrant Hong Kong. I'm Rico. And I'm Mishi. Good evening, everyone. Mishi, it's no secret that Hong Kong is a densely populated city with the enormous volumes of waste that are produced every day. Our three landfills are fast reaching their saturation point. All of us really need to work harder at implementing the three R's. While the government plays a leading role in waste reduction efforts, public participation is equally important. In order to help Hong Kong achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, we must be more proactive in driving the low carbon transition, supporting green job opportunities, as well as adopting more comprehensive waste utilization processes. Our first story tonight is about Hong Kong's steel recycling industry and how it will support the future development of our city's infrastructure. Various types of waste are produced in Hong Kong every day. Apart from common household waste, industrial and commercial waste, such as these office louver panels, can also be found among the thousands of tons of trash. This trading company collects used hardware and scrap metal for recycling. Half the waste comes from domestic sources, while the other half is retrieved from construction sites. The chair, table, cabinet, gas tank, fire extinguisher, which are all made by iron that it comes from the local recycle store. And the second category is from the construction site. It's all mainly is H beam, rebars. That's I call I would describe this kind of materials as like the bone of the structure, bone of the buildings. Most of them comes from the local recycle store. And some of them I for the construction site, I will arrange truck for them. Then they will just came to me, straight to my yard. The collected scrap metal undergoes a number of treatment processes, including sorting and cutting. However, there are currently no means of reusing recycled metal in Hong Kong. The only solution is to sell it to overseas countries, such as those in Southeast Asia. What's more, the trading company has to bear the shipping costs itself. Classify them into different area which they belongs, and then we take out the trash and then we cut them into small pieces. Then we load it in the vessel and the containers. Then it will be shipped from Hong Kong to Southeast Asia or China. Because Hong Kong does not have a local steel mill that can melt all the scrap iron. The drop in steel prices in recent years is also posing a challenge to the industry. According to the government's Monitoring of Solid Waste in Hong Kong report, the amount of municipal solid waste delivered outside Hong Kong for recycling decreased from about 1.57 million tons in 2021 to about 1.5 million tons in 2022. The decline was mainly attributed to a reduction in the quantity of recycled non-ferrous metals. With neighboring economies tightening import control policies in recent years, any materials recycled in Hong Kong that don't meet the relevant standards can't be exported. Yeah, the prices are much lower right now. I will just drop my price <laughs> to the local recycle store. <laughs> yeah, if I don't do the recycled iron scrap, there's not much people going to do this business. A local steel company plans to build a furnace to reduce domestically recycled metal. This will help recycling companies in Hong Kong reduce shipping costs and may very well break the industry convention of only selling recycled metal abroad. The government announced the Hong Kong Major Transport Infrastructure Development Blueprint last month, outlining a framework for the city's transport infrastructure development for the next 15 years. Adopting an infrastructure-led approach to development will ensure that Hong Kong can grow faster and in a more efficient and sustainable manner. When it comes to infrastructural development, a solid foundation is essential. And our first two guests tonight manage a business that provides a key material to make this possible. Please welcome Samantha Pong and Dario Pong, the director and executive director of a steel company rooted in Hong Kong. Welcome to our show. Thank you for having us. Here. Okay. Now, Dario, I understand that you're the third generation successor of your family business. So could you share with us the story of how your grandfather set up the steel mill sure. in Hong Kong? After the Second World War, he came back to Hong Kong in the late 1940s and then started a shipbreaking business in now Kwai Chung. Um, Kwai Chung back then was the shipbreaking center of Asia because a lot of warships, a lot of ocean liners were being scrapped during, uh, after the war. And so 
uh, he, he managed that business for about 10 years. And then the government said, oh, we have to develop Kuai Chung because Kuai Chung is a very deep port. It's not, it's not where the container port is. And we had to make our first move from Kuai Chung to Zhang Bei. And uh, we installed our first electric arc furnace in Zhang Bei in 1979. And then uh, that furnace was operated for about 10 years until the government said, oh, we're going to develop Zhang Bei as a new town. So uh, you have to move. And this is back in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s. We negotiated the go to, with the government and moved to the, our new site now in Tun Mun. And we have been operating that, that uh, facility from 1996 until now. Well, I mean, thank you for sharing with us the highlights of all of these um, historical moments. And your family definitely is a pioneer in the steel um, industry. Now, Samantha, we want to fast forward to the present. So who are your main customers now and what do they use steel for? So we sell and we produce reinforcing bars. Reinforcing bars are used for reinforcing concrete, as the name suggests. Um, our main uh, market is Hong Kong. Um, and uh, both civil and commercial projects need reinforcing bars. So our main customers are uh, private developers as well as different government uh, departments such as the highway department, ASD and um, also housing authority. I yeah. see. That's a wide range of customers. And I know that um, we're not only talking about Hong Kong, the local market. We'll ask you guys more about the other global markets yeah. later on. Yeah. Right. And following up on the steel industry history um, in Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong's infrastructure developed at the fastest pace in the 1970s and 80s with projects such as the MTR and Cross Harbor Tunnel. So, Samantha, is the steel produced by your family's mill still supporting some of these facilities today? Well, fortunately, steel is a very durable construction material so you're absolutely right we had the pleasure of supplying to a lot of these projects including the cross harbor tunnel um, the uh, uh, MTR stations as well as exchange square and Thai Cushing to name a few so your family literally built parts of Hong Kong. <laughs> wow. So Dario, in the 80s and 90s, your company used to sell products to Guangdong. So would you please tell us more about the history and also now with the development of the Greater Bay Area, there are obviously going to be many more infrastructure projects um, on the horizon. How do you see the market now? When, the, when our country first opened up uh, in, the 19, in the early 1980s, the country was, uh, had a very shortage of steel. And uh, we were producing steel here in Hong Kong, so we were selling uh, quite a bit to the Guangdong market. Uh, to name a few projects, uh, the Daya Bay nuclear plant, uh, the Shenzhen Guangzhou Expressway, and for example, the, the Garden Hotel in Guangzhou. We were kind of a pioneer in the, in the Greater Bay concept because we were doing this in the 1980s already. Now, with the new Greater Bay concept, we are very uh, optimistic about the prospect there. Uh, after all, the China market is 1 billion tons of steel versus what we have here in Hong Kong is 1.5 million tons. So we're talking about many, many times the market size, and we're very interested to explore that market. And on the topic of GBA, the mainland has been putting greater emphasis on green uh, development recently. So some of the older polluting plants or equipment are being phased out. Now, Samantha, does your company have any plans to help decarbonize uh, the construction industry? There are two ways of making steel. The first is the blast furnace method, uh, which uses uh, iron ore and cooking coal. And that produces a lot of uh, carbon emission. So the second method is um, electric arc furnace, and that uses uh, scrap, steel scrap, and also electricity. And the carbon emission from that method is greatly reduced, so it's less than half of the blast furnace weight. We're hoping to install an electric arc furnace in Hong Kong. We actually have the license to build an electric arc furnace on our site. So that's what we are trying to do. And also because we have enough scrap in Hong Kong. Hong Kong actually produces uh, up to a million tons of scrap a year. And using this concept of um, made in Hong Kong, as in the scrap is made in Hong Kong, and we can actually use the scrap to make steel for use in Hong Kong. Um, so to create a, a circular economy. And by doing that, we can actually reduce the carbon emission by more than half. Now, speaking of scrap recycling, which is an important link in the steel industry, we understand that there are currently about 50 metal recycling facilities in Hong Kong. Now, Dario, how do you make the most of these recyclable materials, and how is the supply of recycled steel in the GBA? 
Um, I go back to the scrap air, uh, sector first. Uh, uh, we spent about a year to study the scrap market here in Hong Kong. And um, uh, as you said, there are about 50 scrap yards uh, here in Hong Kong. Most of them are actually located in the northern metropolis. So we expect that these yards would have to be mil to, to have to, uh, to be relocated uh, when the, the town develops. And uh, uh, in fact, we are starting to talk to the government about how to consolidate the industry. Mm. Uh, Samantha mentioned that there is about uh, one million tons of scrap here in Hong Kong. We compare to ourselves to Singapore mm. because in Singapore we are looking at about 1.5 million tons, and uh, they have a very regulated. Uh, policy. So these 50 yards that we see here in Hong Kong, if we do it in Singapore, we can consolidate into three yards. Wow. The, f the 50 yards are now occupying about 15 hectares of land. Right. We can probably do it within five hectares. So this is some uh, uh, concept that we want to talk to the government about how to consolidate industry and how to make use of land better and also how to uh, make use of the scrap better. Right, so the priority would be consolidation and yes. updating regulations in yeah. the industry. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to China, uh, mainland China, it's, uh, it's a different story. Because in a developed economy like Hong Kong or like Singapore, uh, scrap supply is very abundant. Mm. Uh, same as in the US, same as in Japan. But uh, in mainland China, because the steel industry only developed about 30 years ago, so Every year, uh, the supply of scrap at the moment is only 200 million tons. Mm. Uh, this is all over China. Wow. Uh, and the steel production in mainland China is 1 billion tons. Mm. So only 200 million tons can be used in the steel industry. The rest would be fresh iron ore, meaning that it's less green because uh, you have to do the, the cook oven process to make, that, to make that into steel. I'm sure with uh, regulations that are more relevant to current times, there's a lot of potential in you know, the entire GBA, right? Mm -hmm. mm, for yeah. sure. I mean, sustainability has been a key word in the past few years and definitely in the present as well. So, Samantha, I want to know with the global warming continuing to deteriorate, it's inevitable that some people will point the finger at emissions-intensive industries, such as the steel sector, mm. of course. So, do you have any ways of improving the image of your company or even the industry as a whole? Do we offer this uh, prefabrication um, service. So what that means is that instead of um, delivering the 12 meter straight bars to sites, so you sometimes you see on the roads uh, the 12 meter steel bars, instead of doing that, we do the cutting and bending on, on our site. And that would actually reduce greatly the wastage um, and also increases efficiency. So that's uh, the first thing we're doing. The second thing we're doing um, is that we installed some PV solar panels. So we have two systems in, in our mill in Chunwen right now. And one of them is a one megawatt uh, uh, solar panel. And that is actually the largest commercial scale in Hong Kong. And that's also the largest uh, possible uh, allowed to be installed in Hong Kong. Now, we've talked about new industrialization quite a lot in our program. So in addition to supporting and emerging industries that utilize smart manufacturing technologies, how would you like the government to assist traditional industries such as yours to truly achieve new industrialization? Um, while I agree somewhat with you that it is ours is a very traditional industry, I also see it as um, a linkage to the life cycle of steel. Uh, meaning uh, we are recycling, we are manufacturing, and we're also helping to decarbonize the construction industry. Uh, we have spoken to different uh, stakeholders in the industry, including contractors, uh, developers, and also other organizations. And we all agree that um, legislation and government policies are needed when it comes to industrialization. Um, because uh, we need them to promote and also to regulate the industry. So take Singapore, for example. Um, they 20% uh, of their GDP, I think, uh, comes from manufacturing, thanks to their industrial policies. And I think the first step our government can do is to adopt a green procurement in public works, and that would be a very good start. Okay, well, I mean, at least right now we know that we're in good hands. Um, we hope that there will be definitely more government support in the near future so the whole industry can improve. Right, and thank you so much to Dario and Samantha for sharing about the steel industry as well as some sustainable practices within the industry. Thank you very much for your thank thoughts. You.
Next, we're going to introduce a remote corner of Hong Kong that's removed from the hustle and bustle of the city. If you enjoy exploring off the beaten path, then Sha Tao Kok is the place for you. That's right, Mishi. The second phase of the opening up of Sha Tao Kok commenced at the beginning of this year. A maximum of 1,000 tourists per day are now allowed to visit all parts of this frontier closed area, except for Chongying Street, after applying for a closed area permit. Whether it's because you want to escape the hustle and bustle of the city, or that you simply enjoy exploring the farthest corners of Hong Kong, Sha Tao Kok in the North District of the New Territories is an ideal destination. Sha Tao Kok Pier is the longest pier in Hong Kong, spanning 280 meters long. It was built in the 1960s and redeveloped in 2004. Today, this is where our trip to Sha Tao Kok begins. Kaito ferry services to Kat O are only available to permit holders. The general public cannot get to Sha Tao Kok via the pier. There are some one-of-a-kind murals near the pier that add colour and vitality to Sha Tao Kok. It's a picture-perfect photo spot. Behind this police post is the famous Chongying Street. This street became the border between the Chinese and the British territory when the new territories was leased to the British in 1898. It became a restricted zone in 1951. Shenzhen's Yantan district lies on the other side of the restricted zone. This is why you'll see law enforcement officers stationed there. Back then, eight boundary stones were placed in the middle of Chongying Street to mark the border between Hong Kong and Shenzhen. They remain standing to this very day. Back when Sha Tao Kot was closed to non-residents, it was necessary to obtain a closed area permit and a guarantee from a local resident to visit. Currently, it's possible to reach Sha Tao Kok via bus routes 78, 78K, 277A and N78, as well as minibus route 55K. If you want to come here in person, you can sign up for a day trip with a travel agency or apply for a closed area permit. Since the gradual opening up of the frontier closed area in mid-2022, many tour groups come through during the holidays to learn about the history and culture of Sha Tao Kok as well as appreciate its natural scenery and tourist attractions. After a morning of walking, it's lunchtime. This Hong Kong-style diner used to be a dim sum restaurant before it changed hands. The customers enjoy the friendly atmosphere here as much as the food. The location of this eatery is quite interesting in that its entrance directly overlooks Chongying Street, which marks the borderline that extends through Hong Kong straight into the mainland. Kisa 我們要去吃茶餐店買東西。Sha Tao Kok Chun, which is next to the market, is unique in that it's the only public housing estate in Hong Kong located in an FCA. A few of the buildings are designed in the style of French country houses, making it another photo-worthy spot. 
but remember to keep the noise down when you visit, so as not to disturb the residents. After leaving the restricted zone, we have time to visit one more establishment steeped in history, Kang Yong Study Hall. Kang Yong literally means mirror and hibiscus. Located in the hacker village of Shengwo Hang, it's one of the few study halls built purely for teaching purposes. It was constructed by the Li clan in the early Qing dynasty as a private school to provide education for the children in the area. This study hall nurtured numerous elites and once attracted many students from Taipo, Sha Tin, and Chunwan. It was later converted into a primary school and officially closed down in 1980s after its last batch of students. The architecture is simple but functional. It's a two-hall building with cock lofts, providing both classrooms and living quarters. The external walls are constructed with grey bricks, while the internal partitions are made of unfired mud bricks. The study hall was declared a monument in 1991. This brings us to the end of our day trip to Sha Tao Kok. Phase 2 of the Sha Tao Kok Closed Area Program has now been implemented. The permit issuance quota has been increased to 1,000 per day, comprising 700 tour group visitors and 300 individual tourists. The area is open daily from 7am to 9pm. Welcome back. Hong Kong's leather consumer goods manufacturers and suppliers export a wide range of products to global markets, including footwear, clothing, wallets, and other fashion accessories. The eco-friendliness and sustainability of leather production has become a topic of discussion in the industry over the recent years, prompting the exploration of potential solutions such as green manufacturing processes. Some brands are now upcycling leather scraps into accessories, such as cup charms and passport holders, while others have turned recycled leather fibers into new materials. Leather alternatives have also been growing in popularity. However, much of the vegan leather out there is merely a greener-sounding version of pleather or plastic leather. These products tend to have a lower carbon footprint than their genuine counterparts, but they can still take hundreds of years to biodegrade. A new kind of plant-based leather has been developed in Hong Kong. It's ready for market and can be used for making items such as handbags or card holders and even applied in the commercial industry as menu and bill folders. Let's find out more about this animal and plastic-free biodegradable leather. With many of us shifting towards a more sustainable and environmentally conscious lifestyle, the demand for eco-friendly leather alternatives are increasing. A startup in Hong Kong made their alternative leather using only plant-based material, such as paper and cotton, and has achieved over 90% biodegradability. Vegan leather these days, normally is some form of fruit or cacti or mushroom. And what they do is they would chop up that particular substance and once it's chopped up, there is no fiber structure. So they bond it together using essentially plastic. And it can be as high as 60%. So what we've done is we moved away from what vegan leather commonly has as a problem, which is they have a majority of plastic, either PU or PVC. So what we tried to do is eliminate that plastic issue completely. So we've developed an alternative leather made just from paper and cotton. We have played with lots of different versions of paper and different weaves of cotton, and we've come up with a very good combination that marries the merits of both paper and cotton to give the three qualities that we're looking for in aesthetics, aroma, and performance. This plastic-free vegan leather material also gave the team a surprise when they developed the aesthetic processing using the material. The difficulties in real leather in mind so one of the really hard things to do that is an effect called brush off so i'll just demonstrate i can brush and you can see it changes color this is the brush off effect so one of the things that we uh, try to do is all those hard things difficult to do uh, leather um, aesthetics we do 
use uh, genuine leather finishing techniques. As an example, we have managed to make genuine looking like ostrich and crocodile. And not only does it look and feel like the real thing, it actually has multiple shades. And if you look, let's say you want to make a really expensive handbag, it has that oily look. And with normal wear and tear, it will vintage. One of the things that we're able to do, because we can manage our raw materials, we can manage the paper that we use and the cotton that we use, we're able to optimize on a bespoke basis things like the thickness of our material. And we can go as thin as 0.3 millimeters, which is really important for packaging. Desmond believes tailor-made products incorporating traditional leather craftsmanship can offer more green alternatives to customers. In terms of retail brands these days, all the Gen Z and the trend is to be as sustainable and environmental as possible. So in any alternative leather product, and in our case without plastic and certified to be biodegradable, is, is a hit. In the vegan leather space, uh, it can be as low as $3 US per square foot, all the way up to $50, which is not really commercial. And we are in the lower bottom end of that, so that we're priced to be competitive. Many believe there's an extra price to pay to be more environmentally friendly. With more choices available in the market, hopefully we can make more contributions in saving the environment. It's really eye-opening to learn about this locally developed plant-based leather. Nowadays, there are actually quite a few varieties of vegan leather in the market that are made with the pulp or fibers of fruits and vegetables, such as pineapples, mushrooms, grapes, and apples. A report indicates that global demand for plant-based leather will continue to rise, with the majority of growth led by the Asia-Pacific region. The market size is projected to reach 1.2 billion U.S. dollars by 2031, which is almost double that of 2022. The primary reason for this surge in demand is the growing awareness of animal welfare, which has motivated consumers to seek animal-free alternatives, especially when shopping for footwear, garments and furniture. And tonight, we have invited Natalie Chow, the co-founder and CEO of a Hong Kong-based sustainable footwear company, to tell us more about this eagle-conscious trend. Welcome to our show, Natalie. Thank you for having me. Welcome. Hello. So first of all, could you give us a brief introduction of what plant-based leather is and how commonly is it used in the leather industry nowadays? It's still a relatively new material. Traditional leather has been very polluting in terms of water pollution, animal cruelty, as well as the waste associated with it. In addition, um, agriculture is also very wasteful. We throw out over a third of our crops. Um, so can we use this waste to make something new and useful? And that's how the idea came about. Mm. Um, so with our plant-based leather, we typically use apple uh, pomace, which is taken from the juicing farm. So after you're you're done with the juicing. Uh, we take the pomace, grind them into powder and fibers before we convert them into plant-based le leather. Mm. So this is actually my first time hearing that apples could be turned into vegan leather. So could you tell us why did you decide to use apples compared with other fruits? When we looked into this industry, there were actually a lot of uh, options, but uh, we wanted uh, the material to be traceable meaning there's globally certified uh, accreditation, such as GRS um, or USDA approved. Um, and on top of that, having the abrasion to be used on footwear. So with uh, footwear, it's tricky because it has to be abrasive, but also has to be breathable, lightweight and flexible. So we had to make sure the quality was there. Um, so we tested with the apple leather and we really, really liked it. So I wonder, how does the carbon footprint of apple leather shoes compare with that of conventional shoes? So we typically compare our apple leather versus say genuine virgin leather. A pair of leather shoes uses about 8,000 liters of water. Um, that's a lot. We don't need to tan our leather. So we just basically, uh, after it becomes fibers, we compress it and we add a coating on it. So that drastically reduces the water uh, use. On top of that, the 
raising of a kettle, for example, is non-existent. Every part of the shoe, not just the leather, was sourced sustainably. For example, the shoelaces are 100% made from recycled plastic bottles. Um, in between the insoles and outsoles, we have a layer of algae. So generally, the carbon uh, emission is lower by 85% versus virgin leather. I think that is super interesting. I mean, it's the first time I'm hearing about apples, and I've heard that you know other people would also use mushrooms or yeah. even like um, grapes. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's very interesting. Yeah, it's a very creative use of raw materials, definitely. And sustainable is a word that's frequently used by brands and campaigns. So, from your experience in fashion marketing, uh, what are some of the environmental issues that you've noticed are especially relevant to this industry? So I've actually worked in the beauty and fashion industry for over 15 years. So I've seen how much waste it's associated uh, with consumption. Mm -hmm. Like first we over consume, hence we overproduce. On top of that, we add packaging, we add all the transportation. Um, so when I started the brand, uh, I really wanted to trim down all the carbon footprint from start to finish. So all materials are actually sourced geographically close to each other, as well as having traceability in every single step of the way. I mean, I'm sure that there is um, a series of thoughts that goes into, you know, why you choose something in the first place. You mentioned you chose apples, you know, over the other fruits. Then I would like to know, um, why did you pick footwear as a starting point of your business? Well, my partner, who is also my husband, mm. um, his family's been making shoes for over 50 years. So they used to be manufacturer and trading company, um, and hence we have the, I guess, know-how and a head start to the industry. Because footwear is extremely complicated, like it looks very simple, but in fact um, there's over, say, 20 components um, included in one pair of shoes. So having the knowledge in the, in the industry definitely helped us. And also the footwear industry is extremely polluting and wasteful. The, fashion industry is the second largest polluter in the world. Annually, we throw out almost 22 billion pairs of shoes globally. And on top of that, I'm a mother of two. Um, I do want to do something that they will be proud of when they grow up. So everything added together, I just wanted to create a startup that is great for the environment, but also has a meaning uh, for our next generation. Natalie, help us understand the challenges you encountered um, introducing this new material to the footwear industry. So this material has been a very new material to our suppliers and factories. Um, it took us a lot of trial and errors to get it right. For example, they're used to making shoes from genuine leather, which has certain properties, say stretchability or the adhesiveness. But with the new material, it doesn't work the same way. So uh, with the sampling, it took a lot longer and it also took a lot of effort for us mm. to explain to them why we're choosing this expensive new material that nobody knows how to work with. So it's really about tweaking the minds of the workers Absolutely. and changing their way of craft. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, so as we can see right here, um, the products looks exactly like a pair of conventional sneakers. So how has the customer reaction been so far? Uh, it's been pretty good. Um, we've launched the brand for almost four years now um, and we've uh, expanded beyond just Hong Kong. Well, we've expanded to Singapore. Uh, we just came back from the Dutch Design Week actually. Mm. We were selected by the Hong Kong Design Center to showcase in the Netherlands um, and we're also looking into expanding into uh, Europe. I think it really means something when you're invited to showcase your products in the Netherlands, which is a country that's known to be, you know, very forward in the sustainability industry. Now, how are your products received over there? And because I know that the uh, consumer demands are very different mm. in Hong Kong and you Absolutely. Know, Dutch, right. Can you explain to us? Yeah. So in Hong Kong, I think people are still quite um, focused on the brand or say the, the style or comfort, which is all very valid. But usually sustainability of the materials comes very, very last. Uh, when I went to Netherlands, they asked me extremely sophisticated questions, mm -hmm. such as, um, what is the coating of the apple leather? Um, how do you uh, treat the afterlife of the shoes? So I was extremely surprised by strangers, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think these are great questions because it shows that they care. Mm. It shows that they know uh, the industry very well. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there is a lot of potential in Europe uh, to take the lead for 
everybody else to follow. Um, for example, they've already implemented, say, transparency indexes. You have to have certain transparency index to put a product on the shelf. Mm. So I really hope to see that um, in Asia someday hopefully sooner than later. Now, I understand that you've also collaborated with other parties to make some accessories. What I find most surprising is that you even managed to incorporate biodegradable elements into sunglasses. Now, was that a big jump for you seeing that your area of expertise is in footwear? Yeah, absolutely. But I think it's also a learning curve for us to understand more um, on other fashion accessories besides footwear. Um, so our sunglasses are made from bioacetate, which is derived from cotton and wood pulp. So it's also plant-based mm. and it uh, biodegrades under landfill environments. I just want to have more touch points for our customers to understand what sustainable fashion means and how can we make it accessible as well as, um, you know, it looks good. It doesn't look like from you know, a sackcloth, you know? <laughs> I mean, if we just look at it, we definitely wouldn't know the difference. But mm -hmm. I think as a consumer these days, um, or at least for us, because it has been a few years that, you know, uh, vegan leather has been incorporated with some even bigger brands, right? So we're more aware of it. So I think now that if I see that something is vegan leather or is biodegradable, it actually gives me like higher value mm -hmm. in my eyes. That's great. Yeah. I think initially when I launched, uh, people questioned the quality. Even now, sometimes I get that. Oh, if it's recycled, does it break apart? Mm -hmm. You know, things like that. But I think uh, from what you just said, it because of other brands, because of big brands have endorsed this green movement, it has really added value to startups like ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it's really about turning it into a norm, you know, having endorsement to bring awareness to the public so there's a higher demand for it. Now, let's talk about the business side. So your company recently expanded into the B2B market by branching out to provide safety shoes for the service industry. So how is the commercial world grasping the idea of sustainability? I think a lot of corporate have uh, really looked into ESG the past couple of years um, and we try to give both uh, the sustainable element as well as safety element to corporates like hotel groups or F&B groups. Um, so our uniform range has uh, an anti-oil and slip resistant. On top of that, we have the recycled leather, which is traceable and I have the reports to show the ESG departments. Um, and we are the first player to be in this space. Thank you so much, Natalie, for sharing your expert insights into sustainable fashion. And of course, we wish you all the best with your project saving the world. Thank you. <laughs> With global warming accelerating at an alarming pace, it's absolutely imperative that we step up efforts to raise further awareness. That's right, Mishi. And the same can be said for the preservation of our culture and customs. A group of Chinese martial arts fans from Belgium came to our city recently to learn traditional Hakka Kung Fu and the Pea Shield Dance, which is a Hong Kong intangible cultural heritage item. Let's take a look. Dragon Dance, Lion Dance and Chilling Dance are all well-known performances, but do you know much about the Pishu Dance? Pishu is a mythical creature in Chinese folklore believed to possess the ability to attract wealth, bring good luck and ward off evil spirits. Pishu Dance is a Hakka tradition where groups in certain areas perform the dance during festive occasions to pray for blessings and protect against negative influences. This activity has been recognized as part of Hong Kong's intangible cultural heritage in the category of performing arts. To understand more about the intangible cultural heritage of the Pishu Dance, today I've come to Sheng Shui Ku Tong to witness the apprentice ceremony. Hmm, seems like it's about to begin. Let's go! It is also a pleasure to be here to, today because my work as a Consul General is to strengthen the relations you might be wondering why Mr. David Lomastro, the Council of Belgium, was invited to this event. Well, it all started with Roland Galland, the star of the apprenticeship ceremony. Roland is a martial arts lover from Belgium who became fascinated with Hakka Pijou dance. 
he found Kenneth, a master in crafting and performing pisu online, and ordered a custom-made pisu from him. That's how this incredible master apprentice bond was formed, spanning across thousands of miles. And now Roland has brought along some of his students to Hong Kong to learn pisu dance and gain knowledge about it together. During the Pishu dance, two people are responsible for the head and tail respectively. The person at the front needs to push the Pishu head up and out continuously swaying it from side to side. They move in rhythm, combining walking and dancing, while showcasing techniques like the golden rooster stands on one leg, consecutive flying kicks, and other footwork. Without a solid foundation in martial arts, it would be challenging to perform a series of high-difficulty movements successfully. Well, hello, Mr. Galland. Welcome to Hong Kong. Can you tell us what's the unexpected challenges that you've encountered when learning the Pichou dance? It's hard to learn you know, because I think you just have also a little bit of an experience. Huh? It's quite intensive. And every new thing we have to learn, which is new, you cannot do it, not do it right away. So we have to learn properly, as good as we can. When you see a Chinese line dancing, Southern line dancing, they're more like sometimes they have a stable posture, standing and just holding the head. But the payao is all the time moving. So this makes it very tiring. But at the end of the day, we, we find out we enjoy it. Okay. <laughs> As a Belgian, what do you think is the cultural significance of learning the Pichou dance? It's a, it's a, it's a cultural art form, huh? which actually slowly disappearing here and there. So for us, we are also we try to conserve traditional Chinese martial art, being a Western. Huh? But we're into it a whole lifetime, so we try to promote Chinese culture in Europe. So the significance is actually we can promote culture and then teach the physical part to a younger generation, to the children, to have a healthy mind, healthy body. In addition to being a master of Pichu dance, Kenneth is also a highly experienced master in the art of crafting. With over 30 years of experience, he has dedicated himself to promoting traditional crafting techniques. The Pichu heads that they dance with are also crafted by his own hands. Tu 幫手一起去保育的,講多了一些古老的東西,給年輕一代知道,希望他的世代能夠流傳下去。這個西的時候呢,就這麼西,用啲手腕力,唉,沒錯,用手腕力。This oh, yeah. event is not just a witness to a ceremony, but more importantly, it brings together people from different cultural backgrounds. They come together with a shared commitment to preserving and promoting the precious resources of intangible cultural heritage. It's much heavier than I thought, and uh, you really have to hold your hands like really right up for the flexibility and all the mobility. Keeping traditions alive is crucial for forming bonds, connecting with our identities, as well as sustaining the wealth of knowledge and skills that have been transmitted from one generation to the next. Sustainability is often associated with cutting-edge technology, but as shared by our guest tonight, the human factor is equally, if not more important, in achieving this goal. Green may very well be the new black, as out-of-the-box ideas and creative innovations continue to steer us in an ego-socially conscious direction.
A collective effort in changing the way we consume, invest, operate businesses, and even manufacture goods is sure to make a lasting difference to society and the environment. That's all the time we have for tonight. Thanks for watching. See you next week. Good night.